Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're glad to have you back with us again today as we continue our study of managing for the Master till He comes. This is lesson number 11, week number 11. We have one more to go, but we've got two great subjects that we're going to be looking at before we finish this quarter. And we're delighted to have with us once again the author of this quarter's lesson, Ed Reed. He is an ordained minister and a licensed attorney and we're delighted with the, with the content that we have found in this quarter's lesson. I know that you have found that as well. Before we dive into this particular lesson, Managing in Tough Times, let's ask that the Lord would bless us. Father, we ask again, as you have in the past, that you would bless us once again. Help us to understand how we can continue to manage our finances in the difficult times that are to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ed, welcome back once again. Thank you. It's great to be here. So we are getting toward the very end. We've covered a whole lot of ground this quarter, and we've got two lessons left, this one being one of them. It's managing in tough times. We've talked about tithe. We've talked about uh, helping out the poor. We've talked about a whole lot of things. But when we get down to the very end of time, the Bible indicates that there are going to be some very, very difficult times. I'm going to read the memory text here. It says, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. At the end of time, there's going to be some very difficult times for Christians. How can we manage our finances? How should we manage our finances and in light of what we know is coming? Well, it's an interesting situation because the Bible talked about difficult times at the end. When we look at what's going on today, we can see that this we're certainly one of the signs of the end. So we've got bloodshed of all kinds, crime, immorality, natural disasters, pandemics. This is pretty current stuff, isn't it? Economic uncertainty and political corruption and much more. Now there's a natural tendency for people in those situations to think, get into a survival mode and think only of their families to make sure we've got everything that we need. But what we're talking to talk about is Remember that Jesus said, if you put me first, what we want to do is think of what God's interests are on the, on the earth. And there's basically several different things we know about. We just can talk about some of that we've talked about already, and that's t taking care of poor people and helping others. Uh, also, helping to see the cause of God go to all the world. And that's one of the reasons I like it is written, because they're one of the international ministries that make sure that people are hearing the gospel all around the world. And people are working overtime and hard times, and they're volunteers and all those team of people here because they want to see the work finished. Because Jesus said that this gospel thing will be preached in all the world for a witness to, to the end. And then the, then the end will come. So I'm very glad for this, that we're involved in things like this. So we're in troublous days. But God says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. You know, and Ed, that really leads us into Sunday's lesson, which is about putting God first. What kind of important spiritual principles can we learn from the story of Jehoshaphat's reign, uh, whatever the struggles are that we are facing? Well, that's a good question because when you look through the Bible, there are many good kings and many bad kings, more bad kings than good kings in Israel and Judah. But Jehoshaphat was a good king, and God had blessed him, and he, he had been able to fortify the cities of, the, of his country and to uh, restock all the supplies that they needed and so on. And then something amazing happened. A great multitude from Moab and Ammon and Syria, huge crowd, his, his spies told him that these, these people were coming into the land and planning to ransack the city. So instead of re resorting to his own energies and his own work that he had done, he called upon God. So I'm going to give you the short version right now, and then I'll give you flesh out this a little bit more. In your Christian life, you do your best to prepare. We talk about some of the things we've already We want to make sure you're out of debt, that you have, you're a diligent worker, that you're saving for the future, and that you're helping others, and so on. But when the chips fall, you understand that God is re really your first person that you call. I remember being in, involved in several trying circumstances in my life, and people would say, well, we've tried everything, now it's time to pray. Joshua didn't do that. He said, it's time to pray first. So they went to the temple. And you remember Solomon said years ago when they, when they first uh, dedicated the temple that if you're, the people of God would pray and look toward Jerusalem during times of difficulty that God would, would bless them. So here they came. The Bible describes it as men, women, and children coming to the temple. The little children holding on to their mother's and daddy's hands and coming there and Josphat made this big prayer. And I'm going to read the prayer to you. It's, it's pretty interesting. We have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you talking to God. 
And then after they committed themselves to God in this manner, the Spirit of the Lord came upon a man who said, this was a man in the audience, and he said, he was a prophet apparently, and he said, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, this is incredible. So the next morning the king assembled the people all together with a Levitical choir. Can you imagine this? This is about as foolish as, as uh, marching qui quietly around Jericho when the walls of Jericho came down. But he said, all, what I want to do is send the choir out first, singing praises to God. Then the, the soldiers can follow them. He's, so the, the Levitical choir went out to the front. Then he, the king admonished the people, these words from Second Chronicles 20:20. 20, 20. This should be underlined in everybody's Bible. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. In other words, since God has told us what to do, let's do it. So the choir began to sing and their enemies destroyed one another. None, the Bible says none escaped, Second Chronicles 20, verse 24. Not one man escaped. This was such a great victory for Israel, though not, no blood got on anybody. This is interesting. That, that took them four days, just or three days, just to collect the spoils of the battle. And on the fourth day, they returned to Jerusalem, singing as they went. Of course, God who delivered them is the same God who we love and worship today. So his power is just as great today. The challenge before us is to trust him and his leading. So God's people faced a great challenge, but he had a way, he provided a way out for them, and they ended up benefiting in the end. Uh, it didn't look like a, a great outcome was coming, but God had that all cared for. That's Trust, true. Trusting God, trusting God. I want to hit Monday's lesson, trust God, not your own resources. We've looked at Jehoshaphat and how he made a wise decision, chose to follow God's leading. What about David? David also learned some lessons along the way. Some of them uh, he may have learned easily and others he may have learned the hard way. What can we learn from David? It's really interesting when you look at King David's life. He was a man of war and uh, best I can tell he never lost a battle. But this uh, great commander was kind of resting in his successes and he decided he was going to count the, the, what we call number Israel to count his soldiers and so on. So he called his, his uh, chief of, our, of staff in the army, Joab, to come in and said, I want you to count and see how many soldiers we have. Go from one Dan to Beersheba, the whole country of Israel, counting all the people. David should have known better than this because his best friend Jonathan had defeated the Philistines with just he and his armor bearer, you remember. A real interesting story. But Joab said to David, trying to reason with him, listen, we don't need to do this. No matter how many people we have, God's always been with us and he'll take care of us. But David insisted that they go. And by the way, it's interesting that when you read 1 Chronicles 21, uh, ver verses 1 to 14, it says, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So it was Satan's idea to count the people, but David didn't counter that. He said, no, God's going to take care of me. But he told Joab, no, I insist you count the people. So when, when the uh, counting was done, they came back and Joab gave him the report. Something interesting, the prophet came up to them and said, you, you've done wrong here. There's three things that could happen to you, and what, what David chose was, I let me fall in the hands of God. So it's really interesting that in the immediate context, attempting to trust in our own power and government can have, uh, and our own bank accounts can have d disastrous consequences. And they did that in this particular case. So uh, you remember that a plague came on Israel and 70,000 people died. It was not their own fault, but this is a re rebuke to David, of course. And this is interesting. At the present time, we want to square up with God, get out of debt, and be generous with, our, with what we have been given. But the old gospel song that I've, many of us have heard before, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need Him now. So it's not time to wait till everything else is done, but to seek God on a regular basis, be filled with His Holy Spirit to give you providential leading in your life, and be ready to follow God's counsel, and trust in the Lord. That's what the whole Bible is about, trust in the Lord. Yeah, I think absolutely an, an important lesson to learn, and hopefully we can learn it a little bit more easily than, than David had to learn it, because that was a high price to pay to learn that. Tuesday's lesson is time to simplify a question. We are facing today challenging times. I think most people would agree with that. We know times are going to get more challenging as time goes on. What should we as Christians do in response to difficult times? How should we respond to it? What should we do? Are there any preparations that we can make? Should, are there things that we can do beforehand knowing that difficult times are coming? How do we prepare? Well, we're talking later in the quarter about getting out of debt. This is very, very valuable. 
The average person has quite a bit of debt, but we don't want to be one of those people because that can really be a burden to us and tie us down to this earth. Uh, I can tell you for one thing that there are many opportunities, even it is written off for some, a couple times a year where people can volunteer and go with them for mission trips. The people that are in debt really would love to go, but they can't afford to be off of work or they can't afford to, the expenses of going and so on. So if you're out of debt, you live a much freer life. You're not bonded, bounded by the debts and you can do things that are valuable. So that's one thing you can do. And I always mention that. Be, be generous with others. God will bless you when you do that. And I, I will also suggest that uh, we, we trust God to start with and just say this is part of our trust in God. We want to make sure that God's with us and that we're with him and we trust him and he'll take care of us. Let me tell you about the possessions. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, we talk about when the Lord comes back, the earth's going to be melt with fervent heat and all the, all the works of men will be burned up. So what we're talking about is we should try to divest ourselves of our assets to help finish the work so that when Jesus comes back, not much of our stuff gets burned up at the end. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. So we're going forward with, with this kind of idea is to get our stuff in such. There's a little statement I've put in here under this section. It is now that our brethren should be cutting down their possessions instead of increasing them. We're about to move to a better country, even a heavenly. Then let us not be dwellers upon the earth, but getting things into a compact form as possible. So in the light of eternity, well, we, we ought to be simplifying because when the Lord comes back, whatever we haven't used up for his cause is going to be lost, isn't it? That's right. Ultimately, everything is going to end up turning to ashes and smoke and will disappear. Everything, every material possession that we have, one thing we're going to be able to keep, of course, as you know, Ed, is our character. And that's something that is indestructible, as it were, at least by fire for the righteous. We are looking at how we can prepare for difficult times, managing the gifts that God has given us. We're near the end. We're on the 11th lesson of 12, the 11th week out of 12. If you have put off picking up the companion book to this quarter's lesson, don't put it off any longer. You will be blessed by it abundantly. It is entitled Managing for the Master. And you can pick it up at itiswritten.shop. Again, that is itiswritten.shop. Just search for Managing for the Master by G. Edward Reed. We're delighted to have him each and every week here this quarter on Sabbath School. And he shared some incredible insights. Some of those insights are in this book. So if you want to dig a little bit more deeply into it, this book is what you want to pick up and it will be an incredible blessing to you. We're going to be back in just a moment or two as we continue looking at managing in tough times. There are tough times today and the times are only going to get tougher, so we're looking for practical ways that we can manage during those times. Thanks for joining us this week. We're gonna be back in just a couple of minutes as we continue our study. We'll see you in a moment. The prophet Daniel writes authoritatively about the rise and fall of kingdoms, the fate of nations, and the soon return of Jesus. Join me for Kingdom Come. We'll witness the rise and fall of global powers. We'll understand symbols found in the writings of the prophets. And we'll learn how Bible prophecy applies to our current reality. Waiting for the world to get better seems futile. We exist in the midst of global confusion, in a world wrestling with the devastating effects of sickness, war, and death. Yet God encourages us. The dream is certain. The interpretation can be trusted. Jesus is coming back soon. The best is yet to come. Don't miss Kingdom Come as we explore the book of Daniel. Kingdom Come on It Is Written TV. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about the study of the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious about God's Word also. Well, I want to share with you another way that you can dig deeper into the Word of God, and here it is, itiswritten.study. Go online to itiswritten.study and you can access the It Is Written Bible Study Guides. 25 in-depth Bible studies that will walk you through the Bible. It's going to be good for you, and it's the sort of thing that you will want to tell somebody else about so that they can dig deeper into the Word of God and come to know the things of the Bible intimately. As you get into the It Is Written online Bible study guides, you'll understand the prophecies of the Bible, the plan of salvation, and more. So don't forget, itiswritten.study.
it is written dot study. Welcome back to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're continuing our look this week at managing in tough times. And Ed, I want to take a look at Wednesday's lesson. Wednesday talks about priorities. In light of the future, how should we arrange our priorities? If, if we want to put first things first, what does first things look like? Well, the Shema from the Old Testament when the words of Moses were serve the Lord with all your heart, your mind, and soul, and so on. This is total commitment, all in for God. And we have many Bible characters that we'll talk about to, uh, next week about that as well. But I like to quote Mark 12, verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. When we give all to Christ, there's nothing left to give to another master, and that's why it is. It said in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold the one and despise the other. And then this concluding statement in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God and mammon. The Bible characters that served God with all their heart, they, they did some drastic things. I mean, they built the ark, they traveled to foreign countries, they committed uh, their whole life to s extending the gospel and so on. These are, are real important characters to me. In 1 John 2, 15 to 17, we're told, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, but then the lust of it, but he that does the will of God abides forever. So the Bible actually harmonizes itself. It says the world is passing away, and that's what is happening. Paul said to us, set your affections above on things above, not on things of the earth. It's very clear for most of us who have lived long enough that more money doesn't make people happier, really. It makes them more miserable, typically. So the more we can help others, the more we can help our family members, the more we can help our church, the more we can help things go forward, help the poor and so on. Those are things we can do to, to arrange our priorities to be others, other, to care for others, not just ourselves. That's the, the big point from this, I think. So God's giving us opportunities even right now to learn how to minister to others, to learn how to have a giving and selfless attitude which are going to prepare us for difficult times. Now, as students of the Bible, and especially of Bible prophecy, we know that sometime in the not-too-distant future, there's going to be a time that comes when, when those who choose to follow God completely, as, as you mentioned a moment ago, those who are all in with God, who aren't holding anything back, who are taking a stand for Him, are not going to be able to buy or sell. Now, that sounds a little that sounds like it could be an anxious time because we stop and think about how much we, we buy and sell today. You know, we buy our food, we, we pay our rent, we pay our mortgage, we make our car payments if we have car payments and so forth. If we are not able to buy and we're not able to sell, that is to make money, our ability to interact financially with the world is inhibited significantly. How is God going to take care of His people, and, and what can we do today to prepare for that time? Well, it's really interesting, Eric, that probably the, everybody here has been to a, a store somewhere where you have somebody in front of you in line when they try to use a credit card that it won't be accepted. And I was recently at a, at a store when a lady tried four or five different cards. To, to it. it must have been all maxed out on her cards because she couldn't make her payment. Finally, she got one, a debit card that worked. And the bottom line is we're getting, heading more toward a cashless society and digital currency and so on. And it'd be very easy to say you can't buy or sell. And that's a big difficult time because the Bible paints a painful picture of the world before the second coming of Jesus. Daniel talks about a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at that time, Daniel 12 verse 1. So considering some of the troublous times of the past he's referring to here, it must be pretty bad. So how much of our lives today revolve around buying and selling? Well, this is interesting because it, we, we do it more than we think. People buy online a lot of times now and they have to use their credit cards. What if, not, what if it won't be accepted? I mean, it's very interesting that uh, we're talking about an unusual situation of re resetting and all that that we, we can worry about if we want to or we can trust God. But not being, able, not being able to buy or sell is not being able to function in society. Can you imagine you, you, your internet will be cut off if you can't pay for it? Your electricity will be cut off? Your water supply will be cut off. It's just, what, what can you do for that? How do we prepare? Well, how we prepare now is by making God's grace uh, part of our lives, saves, not slaves to money or things of the world. We're not bound up by them, but we won't be uh, 
slaves to money when we trust fully in God. Deuteronomy 14, verse 23 is one that I always like to talk about here. God explained through Moses that one of his reasons for establishing the tithing system was that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. This is what tithing is about. If you get part away to God, you, that means you're going to trust Him to take care of the rest. In the Bible, there's something called poetic parallelism. Many of you are familiar when you study the Psalms and the Proverbs that it says the same thing two different ways in many of the verses. Here's one. This is poetic parallelism of Psalm 31, verse 19. We can see that fear is synonymous with trust. So let me read the passage to you and you can see what we're talking about. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you've laid up for those who fear you, which you've prepared for those who trust you. So fear and trust are the same thing here. These parallel lines show that the fear of the Lord is trusting Him. Therefore, we understand that God established the tithing system, not just to protect us from selfishness and provide for His work, but to trust him, help us to trust to Him to provide for us. While being faithful in tithe certainly is not a guarantee that people will stay faithful in the end, those who are faithful will be ones who have learned to trust God, and that's what kind of we're talking about here. Ed, let me ask you, there may be somebody who's watching this program and they're, you know, this week is managing in tough times. They may be thinking, well, I'm, I'm in tough times right now. I'm not even worried about what's going to come down further on. Right now, my situation is, is tough. What kind of words of encouragement, what kind of advice, what kind of counsel might you give someone who says, I'd love to be there at some point and, and, and prepared for the difficult times ahead, but I'm not even able to deal with the difficult times that I'm facing right now. What kind of encouragement or hope or advice would you give to someone who finds themselves in that situation? Well, it's certainly not time to despair. It's time to trust in God and, and to learn His counsel. As we talk, we'll talk about that when we talk about getting out of debt. One of the reasons we're in, people are in debt is because they haven't learned to manage properly or they've had misfortune in their lives or whatever. It's time to pray and commit ourselves to God like Jehoshaphat did. I think it's, it's very amazing that people today are uh, looking to their own resources and, and as you say, if they don't have any resources, what do they do then? Well, you have to trust God for sure. We really can't, people go to a life of crime if they, you know, some people are just desperate to get food. But the bottom line I think here, the, the, to answer the question is put the priorities of the Bible in, in effect, put God first, trust Him, be a diligent worker, and uh, try to avoid debt if at all possible. We'll have a whole set, we've had a whole section on getting out of debt, and this, this is important stuff that we're telling you about. It's not just fantasy. Everybody can benefit by the principles we've talked about here. Honor the Lord with your possessions and the first fruits of all your income. That's what Proverbs 3rd chapter verse 9 talks about. So I would say commit yourself to the Lord. I tell people recently, that I've told a lot of young people, you can't be too busy to be involved with God. You can't be too busy to read His Word. You can't allow Satan to keep you so busy that you don't have time for spiritual things. Because the spiritual basis is what really keeps us all together, especially mentally and spiritually and physically in God's cause. I'm thinking that the more we trust God, the more He will give us wisdom as to what to do. One of the things that God does in addition to the promises and that He's made in the Bible is providential leading. You can pray that God will guide you with wisdom, give you the, if you lack understanding, ask Him to, to give you the wisdom. It's hard to know what to do, what kind of decisions to make in these kind of things, but if you read Proverbs the third chapter, verses 1 to 10, that's where one of my favorite places is for counsel. I think people that can do that will be very helpful to them. So let's flip the situation on its head for just a moment. Let's say that there's somebody who's watching, listening to this lesson today, and they know of someone who's going through tough times, and they have some means to be able to help. What would be some ways that they could assist someone who's going through tough times, but not not be an enabler of continued bad financial decisions on the part of the other person? How might they be able to help someone who's going through difficult times, but not make that other person's life more difficult by, I lack the better term, but bailing them out so that they can get in trouble again? Well, there's a, I would say that you get simple means of uh, instruction for people. Share the Sabbath School lessons with them, for example. I'm sure that there are many people that will benefit this quarter from the lessons because they've tried to follow God's principles and it uh, has blessed them. I can remember days, Eric, you mentioned these kind of payments. There was a time in our lives when Kathy and I had the house payments. We were paying on two cars. We had living expenses, tuition expenses for our kids and so on. And we thought, well, how are we ever going to manage? But we learned these principles early and put them into practice and God has blessed our family immensely. So I think that that's the, the I can give God the credit for that. 
And we all know that, that it's important that we do that. That's fantastic. Great counsel both for those who may be going through difficult times right now and for those who may be able to assist them. And regardless of which camp you happen to find yourself in, I think there's some, uh, some great advice there. Any final words of wisdom, uh, Ed? I want to read a, a quote here from the book Steps to Christ and, and allow you to, to build a little something on it. This is from the book Steps to Christ, page number 44. The author writes these words, The love of money, the desire for wealth, is the golden chain that binds them, that is, people, to Satan. How does that fit as, how does that tie into what we're talking about right now? The Bible says the rich rule over the poor, the borrower is a slave of the lender. So you can't emphasize enough to try to get debt free. This is important because the devil would like us to think about money. This, this one you just read is exactly what happened to the rich young ruler. He was bound by Satan's chains. We don't want to be bound to anybody's chains, especially not Satan and his group. The, the devil is very crafty in how he can catch people off guard. And what we want to make sure is that we have made a provision for our family. We've made a provision to help others. We were faithful with our tithes and offerings. And God will bless those who do that. There's just no question about it. It's been an example in my life and our lives and many that we've helped as well. So some practical counsel this week that we've looked at, how to manage in tough times, times that we may be experiencing right now, but certainly difficult times to come. The Bible tells us that those are just around the corner. And the more that we can get our finances in order today, the better off we are going to be in the future and the fewer, uh, fewer cords we will be bound with uh, by the devil later on. And we need to be as free as possible uh, by the time that comes. And that starts today. Uh, Ed, thank you once again for joining us. We have one week left to go. One week left to go in this quarter and we're gonna tie everything together. I trust that you have been blessed by this journey. And if you have, please be sure to let other people know about uh, this program so that they can be blessed as well. And one final week that we can, gain, that we can glean the last little bits of wisdom and insight from our, our guest, Ed Reed, uh, at least on this subject in this quarter. He's written some phenomenal books on this subject and I would encourage you to pick them up. Uh, they are available uh, at It Is Written and other locations as well. You'll be blessed by those books on faith and finances. Have a wonderful week. We look forward to seeing you again next time when we come back here to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. God bless you, have a wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.